Hello everyone, we are going to be doing the first part of the respiratory lecture. Um, if you watched respiratory failure first, that's no worries. Uh, it will only add to your understanding as we go through this. Uh, I'm going to point out that for your test, um, we're really only going to be covering the ARDS effusions chest tubes portion for the test. The other part is a respiratory refresher, so I am not going to spend a long time on the respiratory refresher. I uh, just want to go through and make sure that you remember all of your stuff from block two. Um, and this is just going to put us back on our map, refresh our brains as to what we are looking at when we're looking at the lung system. Uh, we're looking at a series of airways which lead to alveoli. The blood vessels are all on the outside of our alveoli and oxygen exchange is happening in the alveoli, not in the airway. Um, the airway has no oxygen changing capacity. It's only a tube for air to move in and out. The oxygen changing happens at the alveoli level with the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli. So we're gonna look a little bit more in detail because most of our problems happen here at the gas exchange level on the alveoli. So each alveoli is wrapped with a capillary, one capillary per alveoli, and um, we have this redundancy throughout our lungs. So if you do get a small pneumonia, a small pneumothorax, or a small problem with your certain area of alveoli, then we have enough alveoli in the rest of our lungs to make up oxygenation. But as more and more of the lung gets involved or more and more of the alveoli get involved, then that starts limiting our oxygen exchange. So this is a very brief uh, summary, and I like I will probably go back to this picture a couple of times during the lecture to make sure that you understand what exactly is happening here at the alveoli level. So the alveoli itself is this mark. This is the air-filled sac. So it is nothing other than a balloon, basically, filled with air. Oxygen goes in, and air goes in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, what is happening here is the um, oxygen goes in, crosses across, and this is, this is the alveolar membrane. So we have our alveolar membrane here um, on the inside. Then we actually have the capillary wall here. They are one cell thick. They're very delicate. These two walls are comprised of two cells. So if anything happens to these cells, then this exchange wall becomes um, damaged. And what can happen here is this is blood or fluid. So everything going through the capillary is blood, cells, or plasma. And gases are dissolved in the plasma. On this, in the alveoli, should only be air. Only air. So there should be no fluid. How fluid gets in here is because this is only two cells thick, that if the pressure, let me clean off all my little drawings here, um, if the pressure in here gets too strong, there's too many cells. Let's just draw the pressure in here. So the pressure is increased. So we have increased pressure in these capillaries. Now, instead of just CO2, we have some plasma fluid coming across the wall and filling the alveoli with fluid. That happens to an increased pressure in the capillary space can cause fluid to leak across. The other thing that can happen is not just increased pressure, but um, increased damage. So let's say, let's clear this out again. Let's say that um, you have bacteria in here. Let me draw them into a beautiful green structure. So now we've got bacteria in here. Well, what is going to happen when you have a bunch of bacteria in your alveoli? How do we kill bacteria? We allow these capillaries to open up and allow our white blood cells, who we are going to draw, we'll draw them, I can't draw them in white, that won't show up, so I'm going to draw them in blue. 
This is going to allow our white blood cells across. This is what happens if you cut your finger. Um, the capillaries open up and allow white blood cells into the space to start eating bacteria. So the white blood cells start combating bacteria here. But what happens when you allow white blood cells into the space um, to clean things up is fluid leaking. When these capillaries are open, now we have fluid leaking and white blood cells leaking. We have everything leaking into the space, so this alveoli becomes fluid filled with inflammatory stuff. So if you have bacteria in a whole section of alveoli, then that whole section of alveoli is going to get inundated with a little bit of fluid. This is what happens in a normal pneumonia. It's not something pathologic. It is something that happens all the time. Um, the other thing that happens is that fluid will leak out this way because those capillaries are open. And what is on the other side of this alveoli? What is over here? Nobody talks about what's out here. So we've got fluid leaking both ways. Um, what is this spot? This is the pleural space. So there's no air in the pleural space. This is just space to allow for expansion and contraction of that alveoli. So our pleural space is on the outside of our lungs. And I do believe on the next slide, we show that this right here is the pleural cavity. So we have these are, um, these are our alveoli with our capillaries. And so remember, when fluid is moving into the alveoli and filling alveoli, it's probably also moving out from that capillary because each capillary um, has another side to it. So one side is pleural space and one side is the actual alveoli. So when we look at that, this drawing is definitely missing a piece to it that there is a pleural space out here. And in that pleural space should just be a little bit of like basically lube. It's called pleural, cav um, pleural fluid, but it is just like a little lube that keeps that when this alveoli expands and contracts, it doesn't, that one little cell width doesn't get broken. So there's a little bit of pleural fluid here that acts as a lube and that lives there normally. That pleural fluid just kind of lives there, but we don't have a lot of it, and it just acts as a little lube to keep everything from frictioning together. Um, but when we do have bacteria, and again, I'm going to draw our little bacteria sludge in here. We've got little bacteria in here. That is going to any kind of infection, inflammation, um, something that's not supposed to be there. So even if it's not bacteria, maybe it's tar in the lungs. Uh, maybe it is something that is alternating or damaging the surface here. If there is bacteria in here eating this stuff up, then there is going to be a white blood cell response, and that white blood cell response is going to open up those capillaries to allow white blood cells to come in there and clean up this mess, and sometimes they actually leak over here into the pleural space. So this will come into play when we talk about a couple of different problems, um, but I did want to show you our alveolar membrane, one cell thick, um, our capillary membrane here, one cell thick, and those combine, so the capillary membrane plus the alveolar membrane combine to form a two cell thick respiratory membrane. And that two cells is very permeable. It's supposed to allow oxygen and carbon dioxide across, but of course, in a, in a time of inflammation or irritation, it will allow fluid and white blood cells across as well, very permeable. Increased pressure, increased pressure, increased fluid, or in, increased infection will allow fluid across those spaces. When it should only be allowing oxygen and CO2, but if there's increased pressure or increased fluid in the capillaries or an increased infection in the alveoli, we can have fluid exchanging as well as gas. So I wanted to point that out and just kind of remind you of that. If you're having any questions about that, hopefully as we go through, um, but that is a basic concept. Again, not testable, but a basic concept. Um, 
I gave these to you guys as little badge cards. Um, it's listed in your nursing resources section of your canvas. Um, this is something that I think is very important to have because if you have something that just connects directly to the flow meter, um, it doesn't tell you a percentage of oxygen. So this is kind of your translation table. You should have gone over this again in block two when you did basic respiratory, but I do have this here in case you need it. If you do have a mask or a nasal cannula or something that is not regulating to a certain percentage of oxygen, this is what your flow liters per minute um, translates to in percentage of oxygen delivered. Remember, everything coming out of the wall is 100% oxygen, um, and when it mixes with room air, room air will dilute that percentage down. So when you have a low flow rate, it's very easily mixed with room air and it gets diluted quite a bit. The higher the flow rate of 100% oxygen, the less room air is mixing with it. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. Again, not testable, but for your own knowledge, very important. Um, and I just kind of am going through here just as review what all these things mean in case you hear about them in clinical or at work. A high flow nasal cannula is something that goes up to 60 liters per minute. You can see that our normal nasal cannula only goes to six liters per minute. Um, that does not mean that you're, you, don't, you can't turn up the oxygen on the wall to 12 liters per minute. You certainly can. You can blast 12 liters per minute through a nasal cannula, but the, it tops out at its delivery at 45%. So even if you're blowing 12 liters a minute into their nose, um, you're not going to deliver more than 45% oxygen. Um, that's where the nasal cannula tops out. So if you want to deliver oxygen um, at a higher rate or a higher percentage, then you need to go to a physical high-flow nasal cannula. It is a separate machine um, that is heated and humidified air. And when you start blowing oxygen at 60 liters per minute, you start actually physically pushing oxygen into the lungs and becomes part positive pressure uh, ventilation for you. So this is actually, if you imagine a nasal cannula in your nose, if they are puffing 50 to 60 liters per minute in there, it's coming into your nose at a very high rate and actually is popping open airways and alveoli. So it is considered a form of um, ventilation, a high flow nasal cannula, and it is considered higher support. Um, so it's not taken lightly. So this is basically saying we're giving you nasal cannula at 60 liters per minute. Um, that's going to be a very big difference between six liters per minute and six times that amount being blown into your nose. So just so that you know, if your patient is on a high flow nasal cannula, that is considered ventilator support or ventilatory support. Um, even though it is a nasal cannula in the nose, it is being delivered at such a high volume that it is extra oxygen and extra positive pressure into the airways. Um, so that is done with the advice of a physician and a respiratory therapist, um, and you would need an order, order for high flow nasal cannula. And we will talk about this when we talk about respiratory failure. Um, bronchoscopy, I do wanna call out bronchoscopy as a procedure, um, knowing, uh, and so you might wanna make a procedure card for this. Um, knowing what to expect prior to and post bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy is a camera that we put into the airways. Um, it can go down pretty far into the airways. Um, they use it for diagnosis. They use it for removing things from the airways. Um, if you can, um, when you're putting a camera down into the trachea, you certainly don't want, um, or you're putting anything down into the trachea, you don't want someone vomiting at the same time that there is something holding the trachea open because if someone vomits during that procedure, then it has a direct path into the airways down that, um, down that tube there. So they do rather the patients be NPO prior to the procedure because if they happen to vomit or aspirate or, um, or have any kind of reflux, that could get into the airway during the procedure. So NPO prior to the procedure, um, it is a consented procedure uh, usually, and you can imagine if you're shoving something down into your airway, you are gonna cough, you're gonna gag, you're gonna be uncomfortable, and so sedation is usually given before the procedure. Um, Post-procedure, it is expected that they have a sore throat. You just kind of put a giant tube down your airway. Um, it, there is some throat discomfort. 
Um, we expect a sore throat. Um, when you're putting that tube down into the trachea, it does graze some of the capillaries, especially if something, um, if they were taking um, specimens from the airway or doing a culture or doing um, any kind of procedure, you might have some capillary oozing, some bleeding. So we would not freak out about some light pink sputum if you're coughing up um, just as that as that camera grazed the airways and maybe caused a little bit of oozing, you might have some light pink sputum. Um, and they cannot eat until their gag reflex returns. They might have been sedated past that gag reflex. Um, what you do not expect and what you are looking for is any kind of edema or bronchospasm. So coughing, strider, wheezing, hoarseness, anything after a airway procedure, you need to worry that that airway has become compromised and swollen. Um, of course, when you are shoving tubes down into something, there is the chance that you would puncture your airways or the lung tissue, which would lead to um, a pneumothorax if it's in the lung space. And um, if you puncture your trachea, uh, you can get air escaping from your lungs, not only out your mouth and your nose, but out your trachea into the skin around your um, neck, and that's called crepitus. So if you did um, all of a sudden have crepitus, which is air pockets in your, under your skin, and they call them little rice krispies, um, your skin and your upper uh, shoulder area now start having little air pockets that you can pop. They're like little, little popcorn, uh, what's that, packing stuff. Um, it feels like that where you can actually pop the air pockets under the skin. Um, crepitus is something that you would definitely notice, let somebody know about because it means that the, um, there is a hole in the trachea or the airways that's letting air out. Um, and pneumothorax is air that is now accumulating in the pleural space um, and will be signs of a pneumothorax. You're going to see pneumothorax come up a couple of times um, when we talk about effusions and it'll come up. Um, it's a pretty common um, side effect of having positive pressure or um, air, positive air being pushed into the lungs because the lungs are delicate and they can pop. And when they pop, air is escaping out into a place where it's not supposed to be. And so the two places it can go is under the skin or into the pleural space, and that's called a crepitus or pneumothorax. And then, of course, if we have bright red bleeding in your sputum after a bronchoscopy, that means that the bleeding has not stopped and is continuing, and you would want to notify someone of that. Um, there's no need to call the doc that you have light pink sputum, but it is something that if you have bright red blood in your sputum. So what we're going to do is I'm going to skip through. I'm going to allow you to go through the slides for the um, airway disease, the blood vessel disease, and the alveoli disease because that is all a review of block two. But I do split the diseases up into where the problems are. If the problems are in the airway, you have asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, or cystic fibrosis. If you have a problem in the capillaries surrounding the alveoli, like pulmonary embolus or pulmonary hypertension, which um, we do not talk about very often, but that would fall into the category of increased pressure in those capillaries, which then pushes fluid out into the space. Um, it causes a decrease in flow around the alveoli. Pulmonary high blood pressure is a problem. It usually goes along with um, normal systemic high blood pressure, or it can be on its own for various reasons. Um, but pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary embolus are a narrowing or a blockage of the blood vessels going around the alveoli, so those blood vessels cannot exchange air. Um, and then alveolar disease is a problem with the actual alveoli themselves, whether they are collapsed or full of fluid or full of infection, the alveoli themselves have a problem. Um, and then we go into alveolar membrane diseases, which is those is a disease of that one cell thickness outside of the alveoli. Um, if we have diseases of that cell outside of the alveoli, then we cannot exchange oxygen because that membrane is damaged and that membrane is supposed to be um, where oxygen exchanges across or sometimes fluid exchanges across. You can see that if we're damaged in that membrane, we have problems. And we will be talking about ARDS, that is testable. Um, and then we will talk about problems when we have air or fluid into our pleural space, um, and we'll talk about the three pleural space diseases. 
So the ones that are highlighted are the ones that were going to be on your test, but I do want you to have the opportunity to go through everything else on your own and just make sure that you understand some of the key points about these um, diseases. But again, this is summary of block two. And so if you weren't here with us in block two or you don't remember block two, these are the key points for the main diseases. But again, they won't be on your test directly, um, but I may refer to some of these diseases in your patient care, your patient scenarios. Um, so anyway, I'm going to scroll through this, uh, but please take your time on those slides. If you do not remember these concepts, you're like, I don't remember what a PE is. Um, I don't remember what COPD is. Um, please go through that and look at the key points on those, but you do not need to study these specifically for, um, our exam. These are for your summary. Uh, do, do, do. should have covered atelectasis, uh, pulmonary edema. And again, I'm just going to point out to you um, that this pulmonary edema means having fluid in your alveolar space. So if you are, um, if you have pulmonary edema, if you see the word pulmonary edema, that means you have fluid in your alveoli or your airways. So this is fluid on this side of the membrane wall. Fluid on this side of the membrane wall is a plural. Oops, well, that didn't, didn't write out very well. Is a plural space problem. So that would be fluid in the plural space, which is a different disease than pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema involves the alveoli, fluid in the alveoli. Um, this is where we talked about if you have increased pressure. So if you have a lung infection, we've got white blood cells coming across the surface to clean up the lung infection, an expected thing, but still causes fluid buildup in there. Um, Left-sided heart failure, because we have a lot of pressure and fluid, you have so much fluid and pressure in here that it bursts across and causes pulmonary edema. ARDS, we will be talking about, is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a, um, a membrane problem where the membrane is broken here and just allows everything to flow across into the alveolar space because the membrane actually gets broken down. So pulmonary edema is fluid in the alveoli, in the air sacs, and if you have fluid in there, oxygen cannot get out, can't get through there. So oxygen can't get through this. This acts as a blockade. So oxygen just gets expired back out. It doesn't get exchanged. And um, what else does not get exchanged is the CO2 that is supposed to come out, can't get out. There's just so much. Let's just draw this whole thing. If this is full of fluid, Oxygen is being diverted back out, and CO2, it's supposed to come out here, but it's being obstructed, so the CO2 continues back in the body. So now we have a lot of CO2 that was supposed to be expelled is now just staying in the bloodstream. So this increases your blood pH. Oh, sorry, increases our blood. Sorry, I said that wrong. CO2 level, and CO2 is an acid, so it decreases our blood pH level because this is acidic. So you will find your CO2 level if you took a sample of this blood right here and sent it off for an ABG, it would have high CO2 levels and a decreased pH. So as blood is not able to exchange this, this oxygen is going back out to be re-exhaled. It's not supposed to. The oxygen is supposed to be getting into the blood, but the oxygen is being diverted back out and the CO2 isn't allowed out. So all this CO2 just stays in the bloodstream. So you can see when you have pulmonary edema, this is why these patients end up with, um, with respiratory acidosis. Ooh, going back to block three there. 
Um, so again, I'm not going to really review all of the signs and symptoms. We will save that for when we get to um, the lung membrane disease because we'll end up talking about pulmonary edema when we talk about ARDS. So let's talk about ARDS. Um, this is our breakdown of the membrane, which then allows a massive inflammation and immune response to get into the um, alveolar space. So what is happening here is that ARDS, which you will hear a lot of as we talk about um, COVID. Let me see. My blue pen is not working anymore. Uh, pulmonary edema and alveolar dysfunction here. So alveolar dysfunction means um, bad CO2 and oxygen exchange. So alveolar dysfunction means bad CO2 and oxygen exchange, and pulmonary edema means fluid in the alveoli. So ARDS kind of mimics, but this isn't just in one area of the lung. So let's say you get a left lower lobe pneumonia, then that left lower lobe alveoli are full of fluid because you have bacteria in there, the white blood cells get across there, they're cleaning up that area. So in the time that they're cleaning up that pneumonia and the left lower lobe, you may have a, um, a pleural you get pulmonary edema in that one area of the lung. ARDS is happening throughout the lung space. So this is alveolar capillary membrane in entire lungs. So this is happening in your entire lungs, not just one area of your lungs. This is your entire lung space flooding with fluid. So unlike a pneumonia that is localized, ARDS is happening in your entire lung space. It's not a localized swelling of the alveolar space. It is the entire lung surface is becoming damaged. Um, it is usually an autoimmune response, an inappropriate autoimmune response. Um, this does not happen normally. This is because there is something in the lungs that inflames the entire lungs. It damages all the alveoli and causes your entire lungs to fill up with fluid. So massive pulmonary edema and massive alveolar dysfunction. So we have in our entire lungs fluid in the alveoli and in our entire lungs bad CO2 and O2 exchange. So you can imagine that rather than being localized, which we can deal with, ARDS is a um, not normal finding, um, and it is something that affects the entire lungs. Usually it is something involving a, a large autoimmune response like sepsis. Um, it is involved with, if your patient is super, super sick, um, a severe respiratory infection that is no longer just in one piece of the lungs, but is now affecting all of the lungs. Um, aspiration pneumonia, where instead of just fighting this locally, it inflames the whole entire lung space. Trauma, and we will have to add in here now our new favorite friend, um, COVID here. Because COVID goes in, and um, inflames, and some people, not in all people, um, but in some people, um, will inflame your entire lung space. So this explains kind of the symptoms, and when we talk about ARDS, we are really talking about COVID because that is the problem that most of our patients that get really sick with COVID are going into adult acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so it is, ARDS is an acute respiratory distress because your entire lungs are filled with fluid. Um, and that is, like I said, due to a severe illness. And so COVID-19 would fall under the severe respiratory infection part. So I guess we could write slash COVID there. Because that is really when people die of COVID, they are usually falling under the ARDS category. So if we know this is massive, this is just another picture. I'm not going to test you on the phases of ARDS. Um, but what is happening here is that basically this whole area starts to become permeable. 
not just a localized alveoli, but your entire alveoli um, are becoming permeable. So keep in mind this is happening in all of your alveolar spaces, not just localized, not just one area of the lung, but this is happening in the alveoli throughout the entire lungs, is that this is basically our picture here, is that fluids start shifting in, oop, I wanted to draw, go back, fluids start shifting in here, so this is saying that this capillary wall is starting to get permeable, fluids are shifting into this space, and now we've got more fluid shifting into the space. So in looking at this, um, really, and we're not, I'm not going to test you on phases at all, but in phase one, there's injury to the lungs. In phase two, we start having, you can kind of see the wall breaking down here. This is injury to the wall. So we have histamine, which is an immune response going on here. And then the big problem through the rest of the phases is this increased capillary permeability, which lets fluids through. So we have an increased capillary permeability and fluids then start shifting in. But remember, this is not just localized. This is our whole lung. Uh, this is going on, is that we are shifting fluids in. And as we shift fluids in, um, oxygen is getting, can't get through this fluid. So there is decreased oxygen levels going on throughout the body, which is why they're saying that the patients are talking and doing, they're acting normally, and then all of a sudden they start decomp decompensating. It's because your body can kind of get used to this decreased oxygen level, especially if you're laying in the bed and not feeling that well. But this oxygen um, level keeps dropping and dropping and dropping in the blood. And um, then after a while, the CO2 can't get out either. So your oxygen is not getting into the blood and CO2 is staying in the blood. So the whole process that we talked about earlier, just happening in the whole lung, and it's due to a bad immune response, uh, on histamine damaging the actual alveolar wall. So again, this does not happen to everybody. This happens to the unfortunate people that have this inappropriate histamine response, just like not everyone has hay fever, but some people get massive migraines and stuffy noses and stuff in response to pollens. Not everyone does. And again, not everyone will respond to a severe infection with a massive histamine response that affects the whole lungs. But some unfortunate individuals do respond to infections this way. And again, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, involves the whole lung and fluid shifting into the whole lung, decreased oxygenation, increased CO2 throughout the whole lung. So how do we recognize it? Well, unfortunately, the first cues um, are very subtle, tachypnea and tachycardia. Well, that's going to happen with any kind of trouble breathing or any kind of decreased oxygenation. That's your body's first response is to breathe faster and to get your heart rate up. That's what your body is going to do as a response to decreased O2 levels. Um, so unfortunately, our first response, very vague. These fine crackles are a very good indicator that there's acute respiratory distress going on because you will hear these crackles in all the lung spaces throughout the lung spaces, but they're very hard to hear. Crackles are like a little Rice Krispie pop, like a little snap crackle pop sound, and they're very quiet. Fine crackles are very quiet, very hard to hear. Um, so unfortunately, the fine crackles, tachypnea, tachycardia, get missed um, very frequently. If you have a pneumonia, of course, you're going to have an increased respiratory rate and a little bit of an increased heart rate because your body has an infection going on. Um, but that is our first cues to that we should be concerned about ARDS and taking a further look is continued tachypnea and tachycardia, especially even after you've given some oxygen to these patients. If you are listening very discernly in a quiet room with a great stethoscope, you can hear these fine crackles early, um, but they are very hard to hear, and they will be throughout all the lung spaces, not just in the bases, not just localized. You will hear fine crackles throughout all of the lung spaces. Where do you think you would hear these crackles the best? In looking at the x-ray or thinking about the patient laying in the bed, um, 
if a patient is laying in the bed, um, sitting upright because they probably have a pneumonia or something, your patient's laying in the bed. Look at this amazing drawing here. He's just kind of chilling out here in the bed. Where would you listen to this boy to hear lung sounds on him? Would you listen with your stethoscope up here? Or would you listen to your stethoscope on the backside of his lungs? Where do you think you would hear crackles the best? It would be the stethoscope on the backside of the lungs because fluid is dependent. And so you would listen to the lungs where they're getting fluid, a lung laying down. So let's talk about our lungs. We're going to draw some beautiful lungs here. Our lungs laying down, the fluid is going to collect in the backs and in the bottoms because fluid is dependent. So if you are laying down, you will hear these crackles best in the base of the lungs. So in on the back side on your, so if you're listening just to the tops of your lungs, if you're listening um, up here at the top of your lungs, you're not going to hear these crackles really well. The best place to hear them will be at the base of the lungs in on the back side of your chest. So on listen posteriorly to your chest, listen to the posterior bases of your lungs. Um, that's where you're going to hear crackles the earliest. Um, but you will hear crackles throughout the whole. So your left lower lobe, your right lower lobe, your um, right middle lobe, and your left upper, your left lower lobes on the posterior side is where you're going to hear these crackles. So hopefully that drawing made a little bit more sense. Um, and you're going to be listening for those crackles. Um, if they get a chest x-ray, they will have bilateral infiltrates, meaning fluid into alveolar tissue. Um, so you will have bilateral infiltrates, whereas if you have a left lower lobe pneumonia, you should only have infiltrates or this, um, when you see the word infiltrates, that means fluid in alveoli. Infiltrate means it's infiltrating a space where it shouldn't be. So you have fluid in your alveoli on both sides of your lungs, no matter where your infection is. You might not even have a lung infection. You might have a bloodstream infection, but now you've got fluid bilaterally in your alveoli. That is a sign that you ha might be getting some acute respiratory distress syndrome early. So very subtle. Uh, cues early, but your first cues, again, tachypnea, tachycardia, and crackles. If you, unfortunately, most people don't get evaluated till late, um, your worsening cues is that you keep going up and up and up on oxygen and your oxygenation is not getting better. It's not getting better because your entire lung space is filling with fluid and oxygen can't get through. So increasing respiratory support does not help the problem. And this is, of course, what's happening with COVID patients. They're coming in, they put them on oxygen, and within 24, 48 hours, they have a breathing tube in them because they're not getting better with increasing respiratory support because as the lungs fill, oxygen can't get in. Um, as things get worse, they start developing coarse crackles and rails, which means there's more fluid, so you're not just hearing these very light, quiet little pops of stuff going through your lungs. And it basically is the sound of um, air moving through bubbles is what crackles and rails and um, fine coerce. It just means how much fluid there is. So if you start hearing it, usually by the time you can hear it in a normal hospital room with a normal stethoscope, not a cardiac grade stethoscope in the quietest room possible, you're probably into coarse crackles and rails. And this definitely sounds like bubbling through fluid. Um, the chest x-ray has diffuse bilateral infiltrates. And so the top x-ray shows that we have fluid in our lungs because remember, air is black, fluid and um, stuff is white. So those lungs should be full of black air. Um, there is not that much black air going on. It's all full of fluid. And that's what a white out spot looks like. So these are whited out lungs. These lungs are um, even more white down here towards the bottom. That means more fluid is in here. And actually this area has probably been popped open 
with some positive pressure ventilation. Those areas have been popped open, um, but that's what a white out looks like, and the darker white, the more fluid there is. Um, so both of these x-rays are pretty, um, pretty indicative of ARDS. There's fluid throughout the lung space, not just localized. Um, and this, like I said, increased area of blackened is probably where we're pushing fluid and pushing that fluid down towards the bottoms of the lungs and increasing <clears throat> the concentration of fluid, but also increasing our air exchange space. So that's probably the difference between those two x-rays but that's what the diffuse extensive bilateral infiltrates looks like. Um, this are both white out lungs. Um, and then we will have signs of respiratory failure, which we will talk about very in depth in the respiratory failure lecture. But the signs of respiratory failure are cyanosis, which is decreased, of course, oxygen. This is our actual sign on the patient of decreased oxygen in the blood. Uh, we will have high blood CO2 because the CO2 can't get out. We have low blood CO2 because the O2 can't get in. And we have accessory muscle use because we are trying to use more than just the diaphragm to pull air in. The body is struggling to pull air in and is doing its best. Um, so we will talk about those. So when you study your respiratory failure, uh, all those signs of respiratory failure are the signs of worsening ARDS. Um, these are just, this is another little summary slide of ARDS. Um, the key assessments for any of these lung problems, and you'll see this slide is, is repeated for every single lung disease, because when you are looking at a lung assessment, you're going to be looking at your basically your entire respiratory assessment. So make sure that you are doing a full entire respiratory assessment on anyone with a respiratory problem. Um, each lobe monitor each lobe, right upper, right middle, right lower, left upper, left lower, and listen in the front and the back of the chest so that you can really get a clear picture of what's going on in their lungs. Um, and then again, these are reiterated in every single respiratory slide, but this is your basic respiratory assessment. What is involved with oxygenation, respiratory rate, we are looking at not only their pulse ox and their lung sounds, but all of the signs for cyanosis, the amount of struggling that they're doing, their respiratory rate, their depth, whether they're using accessory muscles, what does their cough look like? Is there an infection process going on? Is there pulmonary edema? Is there now blood in the fluid in addition to just plain clear fluid? What does their cough look like? We'll tell you a lot about what's going on in their lungs. Um, and then the diagnostic test that we do for acute respiratory distress the same diagnostic test would do for any lung problems, chest x-rays, chest CT scans, arterial blood gases, and a bronchoscopy. Um, but those will all just tell us the degree of the problem that's going on. Um, what are you going to do for the patient with ARDS? If your lungs look like this, how do you fix lungs that look like this? How do you get fluid out of the lungs. And those are our interventions for ARDS. How do you get fluid out of the lungs? Well, first of all, we want to, oops, let me go back. Um, you want to increase their oxygen because the signs of ARDS are decreased oxygenation. And then of course, it's getting worsening as you're putting more and more oxygen into the system. Things are not improving. So you want to increase oxygen but you will end up probably using some mechanical support as needed. This progresses to respiratory failure because it's involving our whole entire lungs. So we wanna increase the amount of oxygen and we're going to have to probably increase the amount of support. Um, this support and the reason they talk about BiPAP or ventilator, we'll talk about those in the respiratory lecture, is because this adds positive pressure. And so what we're doing is we're physically forcing air into the lungs, which will then pop open lung space and push fluid to the bottoms of the lungs. So we are physically pushing air into the lung space to pop open some lungs. And that is what is happening in this x-ray back here, is that they are physically oops, going in. And uh, let me change the color. They are pushing air into the lungs at high pressure 
and that is pushing fluid back down this way and pushing air into the top areas of our lungs. So positive pressure ventilation is usually the first place we go, um, and that is usually our first step in um, treating respiratory failure. So the acute respiratory distress syndrome interventions are going to be the same interventions as our respiratory failure. So studying the respiratory failure slide really does help you study the acute respiratory distress because we're going to increase our oxygen and mechanical support. And like I said, this is usually positive pressure ventilation, which we can do via a mask or a ventilator. And that will help us push fluid down and get oxygen into areas that could not get oxygen before. Um, antibiotics, because there is an inflammation process going on here somewhere, so they will be treated for whatever inflammation they have, whether it is sepsis, whether it is COVID, whether it is, and so we could even say on here antivirals, whatever the source of the infection or inflammation is we need to treat. They will use diuretics to remove fluid and they will use mucolytics to, um, to keep the fluids liquidy to remove them. Because if these fluids start congealing um, then they are harder to remove from the lung space. So we will actually try to keep these fluids liquid, keep them moving out of our, um, we can cough them out. So we're going to remove fluids by sucking that fluid into the capillary space and removing it through the kidneys. We're also going to try to let them cough those fluids out, so mobilizing those secretions. So if we have lungs, let me draw our lungs here. So if you have lungs that are full of fluid, there's two ways for this fluid to get out. You can cough it out, or we can send it into the capillaries here and pee it out. So we want to get the fluid out of the lungs. This is an airway problem, uh, so we will use both ways. The best way is to get the fluid literally out by coughing that fluid out, or we're going to pee it out. So we will use diuretics, uh, mucolytics, and mobilized secretions. Those are our real big interventions to get that fluid out of the system. The antibiotics and antivirals will be to stop this immune response that is happening. So you have to treat the underlying infection um, with their antibiotics, antivirals, to stop this ARDS destruction process. But to deal with the fluid that is sitting in the lungs, we need diuretics and mobilizing those secretions to get those things out. So if I could clean up this slide a little bit, I would put um, these mucolytics should really go into mobilized secretions. So antibiotics will treat the root problem and the diuretics remove fluid and so do the mucolytics. They will help things be able to be coughed out. Okay, so I just cleared out the screen um, by accident. Didn't mean to do that. But um, if we are looking to treat it, again, we want to treat the underlying infection and we want to remove fluid. Um, so, those would be our key interventions. Um, so I think, let me just fix the slide a little bit for you to make it a little bit easier to understand. So we're going to increase oxygen and medication support and let's just change this to uh, remove inflammation from alveoli rather than putting them in. We're going to put the meds into their proper categories. So that makes maybe a little more sense. 
So you can update your slide here um, to mimic this one. And for future reference, I will have these slides updated. But really, we're going to increase oxygen mechanical support to get oxygenation through the fluid um, with positive pressure. We're going to remove fluids and inflammation from the alveoli by giving the antibiotics antivirals to remove the inflammation. Um, actually, and we can actually add they will they will do steroids sometimes for this process as well. So those are all possibilities to remove um, inflammation. So let's let me clarify what these are. And remove fluid. Okay, so let's do this way. So we will do oxygen mechanical support and included in that, let's change this to go up here. So sorry for rearranging this slide right in front of you, but hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. As I was talking to you, I realized um, we could make this make a little bit more sense. Okay, so increase oxygen mechanical support. Um, and let's see, we don't need this piece of information. Okay, sometimes I see things as I, um, I look at my slides and kind of analyze them. And I think this makes a little bit more sense, hopefully, for you guys. So these are interventions in order of least invasive. Um, well, not really even in order of least invasive to most invasive, but probably our priorities um, in terms of what would you do first. So um, first of all, we're going to increase their oxygen and support. Um, this will help um, get oxygen in. Positive pressure ventilation will help get oxygen in, and we also counts as helps remove fluids because that positive pressure will push fluid out of the alveoli and back into the bloodstream. So positive pressure ventilation works for our first two interventions. It will help us um, support the alveoli, popping them open, getting oxygen through the fluid obstructions and into the bloodstream, and it also helps push fluid back into the bloodstream, all that pressure. So positive pressure ventilation works for our first two interventions, increasing oxygenation and removing fluids. Prone position, um, I have that on the next slide, will increase oxygenation by providing us more of a surface to exchange oxygen with, and I'll show that to you on your next slide. Then physically removing fluids and inflammation from the alveoli, um, we will use something to treat the source of the inflammation, and we physically remove fluids with diuretics and positive pressure ventilation, and then mobilizing those secretions and enabling those um, those secretions to be coughed out. Um, so this is removing fluid into the bloodstream is number two and mobilizing secretions um, to be coughed out. Remove fluids via bloodstream and reduce. So see, I'm still affecting this side, reduce inflammation from alveoli, and then mobilize secretions to remove the uh, cough. Okay, so that's how we are managing everything in a nutshell. Um, and so those are basically your top three interventions, and then there are different ways to accomplish those interventions. So increasing oxygen, removing fluids, and mobilizing secretions is removing the fluids. So we get the fluids out via the bloodstream, and we also mobilize secretions very coughing. So hopefully that helps. It seems pretty common sense um, that we want to get oxygen to people, and we want to get the fluid out of the way. Um, unfortunately, getting the fluid out is a lot harder job than um, then it looks, if it was just so easy to remove fluid, we would do it right away. But we will give diuretics, which will dry out the blood vessel, which hopefully pulls fluid um, from the blood vessel 
or pools fluid into the blood vessel. So again, if we're looking at that um, alveolar membrane there, and we've got fluid in there, if we um, diurese and dry this out, then fluid is then attracted to the dry space, to the bloodstream, which is what the diuretics are going to do. And also the positive pressure ventilation from above is going to push fluid out. So now with the diuretics and positive pressure ventilation, we have two different ways of getting fluid out of the alveoli and into the bloodstream because the bloodstream is dried out the, the, from the diuretics that fluid will then be attracted to the drier space. And then the positive pressure behind it will even push it even more. So we have have our um, positive pressure ventilation and we have our diuretics, both of those acting to pull fluid out of the alveoli. And then of course any fluid that is left in there, hopefully we could cough up um, or suction up by using our mobilized secretions. So um, prone positioning, again, there's a couple of pictures of prone positioning and a lot of people have asked why do prone positioning work? And actually this is um, what they're doing for um, Sorry, I'll go back. This is what they're doing for um, COVID patients even prior to um, prior to intubation. And what they do with prone positioning is in the backs of your lungs have more space. And so we are dropping, so let me, sorry, instead of writing, drawing two lungs, I'm just going to show you these lungs are side by side. But this is your lung. So you can see that when you are sitting upright, your lungs, the top part of your lungs is narrow and small, um, and the bottom part is big. And when you're sitting upright, all the fluid drops to the bases and you're only aerating this small part of your lungs up here. Here, the fluid will drop to the front and it also removes the weight of the heart and all the other organs. And fluid will drop to the front, leaving you aerating the back space of your lungs, which is much bigger. And so you'll aerate a much larger part of your lungs. So prone positioning allows fluid to drop down into a larger space um, and allows you to aerate a little bit more of your lungs. So prone positioning, um, the only part of it is that the backs of your lungs are actually bigger than the fronts of your lungs because the fronts of your lungs and so I actually I probably didn't draw this um, completely the best way if you look at this the fronts of your lungs they your heart's in the front and you got a lot of stuff in the front so actually the backs of your lungs are um, more space so if you occlude all this right here you still get a bigger aeration spot where you're laying on your front side which is why people um, will try to tripod and stuff like that is that if you are sitting upright like that, then the backs of your lungs are bigger, but the fluid's all at the bottom and you're only left with a top, your aeration at the very top. So there's not as much fluid space, but people will lean themselves forward and then that fluid, um, if your lung is big, your fluid will fl move forward a little bit and aerate a larger space. So that's why people dry pot, they tripod, is they're trying to push themselves kind of towards a prone position um, and aerate themselves a little bit better. So prone positioning can be done manually, like the patient on the bed here, where they are laying uh, supported under pillows to keep them in the prone position, um, the arms up in a swimmer's position to keep people more comfortable. If you've worked on a COVID floor or seen COVID patients, um, prone positioning is the best for aerating a larger part of your lungs. Um, and then the beds is what's listed at the bottom there. And again, with COVID, we did not have enough of these roto-prone beds. This bed will... Um, lay the patient on their stomach, keep the patient on their stomach, but it actually rotates back and forth. So we're doing mobilized secretions in addition to proning. Um, whereas if you're laying on your um, prone position manually, it's hard to do the rotation. We can get um, the bed to physically rock back and forth though to rotate and mobilize secretions. But prone positioning um, is an intervention to increase oxygenation because you physically change where the fluid is collecting and allowing a larger part of your lung open. So that's why prone position goes under increased oxygen um, because that is going to allow more to aerate. Um, and then, so proning doesn't actually remove fluids from you. It just kind of shifts the fluids around. Um, so you still would need to, in addition to prone positioning, um, you would need to be doing diuretics and positive pressure 
uh, ventilation to help get that fluid back into the bloodstream. We're stuffing it back into the bloodstream so it could be peed out. And then you would still be able to, you need to get these people um, mobilized, whether it's turning the bed or somehow getting them to move around or doing coughing, deep breathing, um, doing chest percussion uh, vibration to try and get those secretions up and out of the lungs to cough out. Um, so that's a little bit on prone positioning, and that's why we put it under the oxygenation is what it does to the lungs is allow more room to aerate. So that is ARDS. I'm going to let you take a little break and hit pause on it. So um, this is where I would have you take a little break here before we go into the pleural space diseases and talk about the three different kinds of inappropriate stuff in the pleural space. So hit pause now, take a break. And if you are back or ready to just keep going, I will keep going through. Now we're talking about ARDS and pulmonary infiltrates were fluid in the alveoli. So pulmonary edema, pulmonary infiltrates, all means pulmonary fluid in the alveoli. A pleural space disease or a pleural effusion, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax, is not in the alveoli. So I'm going to write that under here. Not in alveoli. Not in the alveoli. It is in that space. So when we were talking about our little diagram here, here's our alveoli, here's our capillary, and then we had fluid in here, which would be called pulmonary edema or pulmonary infiltrate. We also had fluid leaking out of this capillary into the pleural space. And so when we talk about an effusion, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax, we are talking about this pleural space on the other side of the capillary, which is in between um, the alveoli and the, uh, the actual wall of our lung. So that means this is fluid, whether it's fluid or air, something is in the pleural space it's trapped. It can't get out. Whereas alveoli, if we have fluid in there, it can get out by coughing it out. You cannot cough out pleural effusions, pneumothorax or hemothorax, because they don't exchange with um, they don't exchange with the alveoli at all. It's on the other side of this capillary. Um, so this will eventually, hopefully go away if it's tiny, but if it's large, it needs our main intervention for all three of these is a chest tube. Um, so effusion is in the plural space. Effusions and hemo and pneumothoraxes are in the plural space and their main intervention is a chest tube. So let's take a look at each one of these. Um, the pleural effusion is a collection of inflammatory fluid in the pleural space. Um, and this is where we had that picture from before that we were talking about. Let me get back to my drawing. So I'm going to just keep drawing this beautiful alveoli and its capillary. And this is where we had, for some reason, an infection here that has now gotten white blood cells and fluid to come out of the blood vessel to clean up the alveoli, but because that capillary is leaky, some of it goes the other way and leaks outside into the pleural space, and that will lead to a small effusion. They are expected findings with pneumonia, TB, chest trauma, because the whole area is trying to be cleaned up by the white blood cells, and the reason, the what we do is we make our capillaries leaky to allow the blood cells to get through to clean things up. So this is an expected finding. If your capillary is leaky, stuff is going to leak out of it and create pulmonary edema and um, effusions. So you'll get infiltrates and you will get effusions. Infiltrates is going into the alveoli. Effusions is coming out into the pleural space. Um, so let me, just to reiterate that topic, if we are talking about this little guy and we have fluid coming through here, this is an infiltrate 
and this going out here is the effusion. So if it's an immune response and it's getting into the alveoli, it's called an infiltrate. If it's getting into the pleural space, it's called an effusion. So hopefully that helps if you're reading x-rays or seeing things. If it's an infiltrate, um, you can probably cough it out. <clears throat> if it's an effusion, it's stuck in the pleural space. Um, usually they will say, okay, cancers, of course, there's a constant white blood cell. If you have a cancerous source here, there's a constant um, influx of white blood cells trying to clear that out. If you have damaged vessels, chest trauma, um, or any antibiotics, you're going to get, or any um, pneumonias or infections in the lungs, you're going to have this inflammatory fluid coming both ways. You probably have an infiltrate and an effusion, and we would expect that. Um, small ones can be dealt with um, symptomatically. Large ones will need the intervention of a chest tube. Um, a pneumothorax is air in the pleural space. So if we have, again, I'm going to draw my little alveoli. We're going to draw our little alveoli, except this poor little alveoli has a hole in it. So if this alveoli has a hole in it, this air will escape. It escapes through this gaseous membrane and that air will start going into the pleural space. Remember, pleural space is trapped space. Um, so every time you inhale, fluid escapes into that space. And when you exhale, um, it just stays stuck there. So it keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, the difference between a small and a large one is that a small one, and remember as air stays trapped in the pleural space, then it will start compressing the, um, the lung around it because it's trapped. Air that is trapped um, can't get out and so it ends up compressing on that lung space and making that physical lung smaller, making those alveoli tinier as they get compressed. And a large pneumothorax essentially basically compresses your entire lung, whereas a small pneumothorax, you're having a small amount of compression. But the key thing is that anything that gets into the pleural space, whether it is fluid, air, or blood, is going to be trapped in the pleural space. And because it's trapped, we have to find a way to get it out. You can't just cough out the air. You can't just dissipate the air out into the atmosphere because it is trapped in the pleural space. Um, this is generally due to an actual damage of the alveoli. Um, maybe they were punctured by a rib trauma. Maybe they were um, punctured by extra air. Maybe they spontaneously burst. But somehow these alveoli got a hole in them, and that is allowing air to escape into the pleural space. Um, so if that happens, that is air in the pleural space. It's called a pneumo, meaning air, thorax, meaning air in the chest space where it shouldn't be. Um, I'm not going to make you read x-rays of, um, of any uh, chest x-rays, but the way that they notice it is that, uh, remember, air is dark. Um, most of these lungs you see have like little spirey kind of veins around them. Those are actually the capillaries around, so it is normal to see these little white spidery vessels in there because these are all the capillaries around the alveoli. Those are normal findings. If you look over here, you see kind of a line and then you see no spidery, no little spidery veins in there. That's because this is, that's not lung tissue anymore. That's trapped air. The lung tissue is the stuff with all the spidery veins and it's been actually compressed by all this trapped air. And you can see that much more dramatically in here that this is the trapped lung and this is all empty air that has been stuck. This is non-exchanging air, meaning that it can't get back in to get expelled out. It is trapped air. This is the pneumothorax. Um, so 